carried out by Center for Europe, University of Warsaw, in cooperation with the other partners, what you can see here. It's important to know who financing this project. Now, in this moment, uh, we finish the open remarks and we are going on to the uh, first panel. Uh, unfortunately, our colleague Adriana Sniadowska, uh, uh, who was planned to be the moderator, uh, didn't came here according to the new obligations. And the moderator for this panel would be director of Center of Europe, Dr. Kamil Zajotskowski. Kamil, please, floor is yours. So, the end of the age of innocence, we have the end of the age of innocence. No peaceful time, no peaceful transformation. And everything, it started, and I give you some data. Maybe I will start from 2008. What's happened in 2008? So please feel free and you can tell me. What's going on, what's happened in 2008? Yes? Global crisis. Yes, exactly. We had global economic crisis. And you use the word global. But to be honest, in 2008, we had not global economic crisis. Professor Gordana Durovich knows better than me because she's an economist. We had the West economic crisis. So 2008, it means the West domination down. Who was winner in 2008? Yes? I assume China. Yes, of course. In 2008, China and emerging markets was number one. So in 2008, the West domination is down and emerging markets came up. 2014, you have on the table. What does it mean? Russia aggression towards Ukraine. Okay, but in global context, what does it mean? Military factor is very, very important in global efforts. Because at the beginning of 90s, at the beginning of 21st century, everybody thought, okay, we, don't, we didn't have war, we have peaceful time, so military factor is not very important. In 2014, Mr. Putin said, no way, military factor is very important part of foreign policy. What's happened in 2016? Also you have on the table. Mr. Trump, Brexit, and later we have COVID. So, for Trump, not United Nations, not European Union was important issue bilateral relations. Mr. Trump came to the European Union? No, he came to Germany, he came to France, he came to Poland. He didn't understand what doesn't mean European Union. And of course, Brexit and COVID. And what doesn't think everything for global issue? It means globalization. So, globalization is a part of what's happened now. And the last but not least, the war in Ukraine in 2022. What does it mean for the international relations? 
we have two opposite global order. The first is the West. The second is China Russia domination. And it is very important where Balkan states will be in this or in China Russia <coughs> influence. So the global issue is divided on two parts. The first part is the, f the West. The second is China, Russia domination. So we don't have time to wait and you must be a part because you have, you don't have, uh, you have to, uh, opportunity to choose. You stay in, in the West or you stay not in the West in China, Russia influence. And it is, of course, the question about global south. For example, I am sure that you know uh, this. If I call to my colleagues in India or to South Africa, they support Mr. Putin, not the West. OK, point number two the consequences for the European Union. Everything what I said, it is not good for the European Union. Why? Point A, the EU is a child of multilateralism and neoliberalism. Today, like I said, it's not good time for multilateralism. Point B, the EU is soft, civilian and normative power. It is not good time for soft and civilian power. Today it's good time for hard power. What does it mean hard power? You know? Please feel, yes? Yes. Hard power, it means you can use military power. Unfortunately, the EU doesn't have military power and probably in the future will not have military power. And point C and D were not good at geopolitics. The EU is not a, a state. So we are not good in, at geopolitics. And of course, we fought. We can, made, we can make business with Putin and no war. Unfortunately, it's not true. We did business with Putin, and the war is kicked off. So, to sum up, all what's happened in global efforts is not good for the European Union, because we are not hard power, we are soft power, and we are not prepared for this. Point number three. The EU, like Mr. Borrell mentioned a few months ago, we must use the language of the power. And if we talk about our security, the most important player for the European Union is NATO. Without NATO, the EU power will be weaker and weaker. And, of course, point number four. We have something like common security and defense policy. But the common security defense policy, it's not military power. We, all, we, we, can, also, uh, we can only send small military and civilian operation and missions. But please remember, common security and defense policy is not military power of the European Union. And next point. To be honest, we don't have one 
common foreign EU foreign policy. If you look at Iraq, if you look at Kosovo, for example, how many states recognize or not recognize Kosovo in the EU? In, in the EU, we have 27 member states. How many doesn't recognize Kosovo? Yes? Five. Exactly, five. So five states of the EU doesn't recognize Kosovo like independent states. So we don't have one common foreign policy. Uh, as you see, the title is the impact of the war in Ukraine on the Western Balkans and Montenegro. It's my speciality. I'm a long time professor of regional security and management. And I like really to analyze those problems because our life depends of that, what we'll be doing in our region. According to the influence, thank you. According Unfortunately, uh, during the time as a part of Soviet Union, uh, Ukraine changed many times the borders and uh, has very intensive of uh, process uh, of life in his history. Under the direct influence and with the direct organization and support Moscow, Pro-Russian political forces in Crimea responded by holding a referendum in March 2014 in which the majority of participating pro-Russian citizens voted for independence from Ukraine and joining Russia. Crimea was an exit to Russia with presence of Russian military forces as one of the autonomous republics and moved to did not receive international recogn uh, recognition. Of course, it was the first step for divided Ukraine from Russia. Uh, you know that Russia and Ukraine are two of the biggest states in the Europe. And that Ukraine is very important for producing a food, first of all. The biggest producer of food in Europe in previous time. Uh, the main uh, problems is Aggression Russian on Ukraine on 24 of February 2002, when 100,000 soldiers from Russia moved to the Ukraine territory. Uh, in all part of Russia, you can see from the north to the east and to the western and south of Ukraine. It was March 2002. You can see this in this picture. In November 2002, something is changed. Kherson and Krakow, uh, Ukraine back on the his, she's ownership. But now we have the counteroffensive uh, during six months of the Ukraine supported but uh, from the Western Union. We can speak that this counteroffensive successful or no, uh, but many territory back to the uh, authority of uh, Ukraine. Uh, 
When it attacked Begin, it was special operation, as Putin said. Which type of special operation? If you are occupied, uh, one third of the territory of uh, your neighbor, you are naming special operation. It is, of course, very arrogant from Putin's side. This was also confirmed by the signing of the Memorandum of Security Assurance under the auspice of the OSC and Budapest in 2004, 1994, which welcomed Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Ukraine into the 30 of the non-proliferation and nuclear weapons. On that moment, Ukraine back or nuclear potential uh, to the Russia. And Russia guaranteed the security of Ukraine. <laughs> now, Russia occupied Ukraine. It is a really good neighbor. Uh, but it's a big brother. Uh, always big brother have different opinion. Uh, what is the basic for the aggression of uh, Russia on Ukraine? First of all, it is national security concept from 1997. And supplemented in 2000 years when Putin occupied the position of the president of Russia and started to be the main authority, the main person in Russia still now. Uh, this strategy, so-called Putin's doctrine, uh, this doctrine, national security strategy, only improving during the time still 2020. Uh, for, from this document, the main threats for the Russia are, first of all, NATO, the deployment anti-missile defense system in Europe, Asia and Middle East, EU and US support to Ukraine, right wing nationalism in Ukraine. As you know, the main reason for uh, the moving special operations, as Putin said, is the Ukraine Nazism. It is only the Putin's opinion which he putting in a public of Russia. That is, Ukraine the main potential enemy for Russia in a future time. Uh, weapon for massive destruction, terrorism, misuse of ICC, ICT, transnational organized crime, and climate changes, and more. What was the result of this aggression? It's a tectonic changing in international order. The United States, Russia, and China today stand at the greatest distance from each other since the end of the Cold War. It is true. Uh, what is the result of this type of relations? Probably new type of relations in international community. 
Contrary to Putin's expectation that the high dependence of the mere European countries like Germany, France, and Italy on Russian energy resources would lead to discord among EU member states and subsequently with the United States did not materialize. Instead, Russia's aggression against Ukraine has united the EU and NATO more than ever since World War II. But during one and a half year of war, uh, the opinion is changing. We can see that uh, Hungarian Prime Minister Orban two days ago visited Putin and they told about using the potential of energy from Russia to the Hungary. We will see what we'll be doing in a future time. Nobody on the world cannot and to be sure with his vision or definition for the future. Because the war doesn't have a logic. No any war in the history no had a log logic. It is the key question. Sun Tzu and Clausewitz said also this sentence. Uh, in contrast, Russia seeks to enhance its alliance with countries such as China, India, South Africa, Brazil, North Korea, Turkey, Syria, Nicaragua, Venezuela, Venezuela, Iran, and unfortunately Serbia, attempting to create a new alliance which would represent a significant party and a new balance on power in the international relations. My colleague Camille can confirm when I had a lecture in Belgrade on the Faculty of Political Science, when I speak about that, all of the academics was quiet. Nobody to say no any sentence that I am right or no. Probably. It's the authoritarian, authoritarian regime in Serbia. And they didn't comment nothing. Uh, Serbia is very important in this moment. And Alexander Vucic using it. Very good. Uh, we will see in the process how Serbia will find the best solution for their citizens and for the state. Uh, the new NATO strategic concept in Madrid in June this last year said that is Russia main problem for the security of NATO area. That is, China, which was previously referred to as a partner, but is now considered a challenge for the rules-based global order. That, it means that China is potential enemy for NATO. And we will see behavior China on the Pacific area. 
according to the Taiwan, according to the South Korea. Uh, unfortunately, the leader of uh, North Korea visited Putin one month ago, and they agreed about the weapons to taking from Putin taking from North Korea in a future time. NATO reacted from 40,000 to 300,000 to be readiness on the border toward Russia. And, of course, the traditional state which was the neutrality as Finland and Sweden, are now in the process. Finland is the member of NATO. Sweden, you know, that uh, have blockade from the Turkey, yet, according to the any saving the members of uh, radical uh, workers, organization from the Turkey, uh, which uh, Turkey recognizes as a terroristic organization. And of course, they fire the Quran in uh, Stockholm. Unfortunately, we had the situation that uh, two person from Sweden who came to the uh, football competition in between Sweden and Belgium in Brussels uh, were killed, killed of uh, the radical person from Tunisia. Uh, of course, the Western Balkans and the Black Sea region are strategically important for the Alliance. It is on the point 45 of the strategic concept of NATO underline. Uh, what is the influence Russian aggression for the changing situation in EU? Natural gas, the second largest exporter of crude oil and the third largest exporter of the coal was from the Russia. But it was the reason for European Union to find the alternative resources for the energy and it will be probably renewable energy, maybe it's the same time support from uh, Russia to the European Union to make this very important decision. Uh, in opposite side, nobody knows when European Union and especially Montenegro will become the green area. I hope that it will be good reason for making a green area in Europe. In response to the Russia invasion, Kiev officially applied for the Euro for European Union membership, to which the European Commission responded by recommendation candidate status for Ukraine along with the Republic of Moldova and recommendation that was anonymously approved by the 27 EU leaders in June 2002. Professor Gordon Adjurovic knows better this uh, question and probably she will more explain it. Uh, about the Western Balkans, have also been noted on the strategic compass for stronger security and defense of the EU European Union until 2030. Uh, 
which states that security and stability in the entire Western Balkans are not yet complete, also due to uh, increasing foreign interfe interference, including information manipulation campaign. It is very important for our today topic. Uh, in Western Bank, Balkan, as a part of Euro-Atlantic area, expected as a battleground for future conflicts, a timely EU response that involves concrete action to integrate the region could print the spread of Mali influence in the region. Uh, repercussion in the Western Balkan, which has traditionally been a sensitive point in European security, is the main question. Western Balkan is not stable. Western Balkan has very poor institutions. Leading on this area is Serbia. Uh, why? Which, like Russia, has not accepted territorial uses from the 19th after the dissolution of Yugoslavia and questions the independence of the successor state, assuming a role similar to, to Russia in Ukraine since 2014. As you know, the metropolitan of uh, Montenegro, the Serbian Orthodox Church in Montenegro, Ioannikia last year said, Ukraine for Russia is the same as Montenegro for Serbia. He's... I will not uh, speak too long and maybe to create more, more time for your questions. Uh, I am also uh, thankful for inviting me on this uh, event, on this uh, very special location for me. And of course, uh, that majority of uh, participants are quite young, so for you probably this is a uh, quite provoking topic. Uh, I am uh, deeply involved in the process of analysis of our integration path and uh, I use this opportunity not to talk only about uh, Ukraine and this format of uh, impact on our region and Montenegro but also to put it in one broader context what this means that uh, I will talk shortly about uh, integration SWOT what we can count as uh, strength and benefits of process of integration and what we can uh, also detect as potential problem of threats for our small country. Uh, so uh, for the first, let's start off map. If you look at in the trends on uh, regional conferences in last 10 years, there is quite strange trend uh, because of ruining of relation between Pristina and Belgrade dialogue. They start to recommend not to use flags on uh, regional conferences. Then uh, they continue not to use uh, maps because of the borders, then not to use uh, even names. So if it is possible to talk about Belgrade and Pristina, why not to add Sarajevo, Podgorica, Tirana and other. And finally, I also saw some uh, uh, declaration of uh, regional ministers of our countries. Uh, we are also participants, administrations, uh, partners, just to avoid any kind of uh, messages as countries because of sensitivity of uh, Belgrade-Pristina relation. So they like to see, for instance, some declaration, there is uh, six uh, minister of foreign affairs, but of nowhere. So without uh, naming of country, on which, on which country they are ministers. But it is, uh, just to, it is just confirmation how things changed in the last 10 years with the mandate of uh, Alexander Vucic in Serbia and strong new politics towards the region in an uh, envelope of uh, Serbian uh, world 
and uh, now we are leaving it. So if you talk about maps, I still keep borders. <laughs> I like it because it is a realistic approach. We can't, uh, uh, we can't avoid it. Uh, now enlargement policy is a little different uh, without changes of legal acts, without changes of treaties. So we have uh, uh, enlargement countries such as a group of countries integrated within the energy community. So it is the key message regarding changes of uh, global context uh, within the Europe. So enlargement is closely linked to energy policy and uh, in that context also impact of war of Ukraine. Uh, what is on this map not so important in this moment for a counting of membership is position of uh, uh, Turkey or Turkey now, new, <laughs> new word, uh, because uh, in uh, calculating new potential 62 million members of European Union, it is without uh, that country. So we just talk about Western Balkan 6, Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia potentially, still potential candidate as Kosovo. Bosnia is, uh, of course, uh, candidate, achieved it in December last year when Kosovo submit application. So, uh, one sensitive issue today is the uh, issue of language, uh, what we will put in uh, our census uh, questionnaire. Uh, I like to talk with students about that in the European context, just to try to make bridges that there is enough space for all. Uh, let's suppose in one moment that we are all in front of the European door, and uh, six of us, so Serbia, for instance, uh, entering first, as a first country. And then look at in official languages of European Union, there is a list of 24 languages, including uh, Irish, quite new one, with Bulgarian and Romanian from 2007, and Croatian from 2013. Then Serbia, of course, uh, after that question said, I will enter uh, with the Serbian language as uh, additional value for European uh, multicultural structure, and uh, Serbia enter. Then after Serbia, for instance, the uh, next country is, um, let's talk, um, Bosnia. Bosnia, look at in the list of official languages, and then look at it in, so they are Croatian, and then of course there is Serbian now. Then what Bosnia will enter as additional wealth for European multiculturalism? Which language? What is third official language in Bosnia? Bosnian. So Bosnia will enter with Bosnian language and all they are with their space. After Bosnia, for instance, uh, Albania can enter. Which language will Albania enter? Albanian. After Albania, maybe North Macedonia will enter. Which language after that, because of the structure of ethnic population in uh, Macedonia, which language North Macedonia will give to European culture? Macedonian. Then, for instance, Kosovo, even before Montenegro, can join. Kosovo, just check all foreign languages on the list of official languages. Everything is there. No problem, we can just enter. Then Montenegro, finally, is on the road to, to enter. Uh, which language Montenegro, and only Montenegro, can enter in the European community? Montenegrin. Is it okay? Is it okay that we can enter our first official language according to our constitution, our negotiating position, official platform, where what we are negotiating for 11 years, in the case when already in you, let's imagine it, is Serbian, Croatian, Bosnian, Albanian, Macedonian, and we are only invited to add additional official language. And my question towards you is, is there enough place for all? You know the rules. If you like to talk with European Parliament and you like to submit something on Cyril, on Bulgarian, you can insist that response could be the same. Or if you like to talk with the Commission on Montenegrin, on Latin, or on Serbian, on Cyril, you can do it. So each European citizen from Western Balkan, in that case, can talk, can use the same language what they like, how they feel it. 
So I like just to share with you that possibility that European integration, in, sp in spite of all these risks and external shocks, is place for all. There is enough space for Serbian language and for Montenegrin language. It is not a problem. And we should keep that diversity of European culture, roots, and languages. For instance, Commission uh, spent 15 years to strengthen translation capacities for Irish language after 2007 to have enough translator in translating industry in, within the European institution to have translation in Irish language. So I think that we can also use the same approach. So in Montenegro, 80% of population is for European Union. How many supporters for European integration of Montenegro is in this hall? I like to see your hands. More than 80 or less? Less. You should go on additional classes. OK. Usually, in my classroom, it is 100%. Uh, after MAP, we have this plan, what they used to call uh, 2030. So, even if we talk about economy, even if we talk about philosophy, that there is no free lunch, uh, free lunch in economy, even then we can talk that always it's good to have alternatives. If we talk about strategic integration path, that for Montenegro, the only part is that, if we really like to generate democratic values and rule of law. So uh, what is new proposal? It is four tiers or centric uh, European um, rings. First one is Eurozone. We already use Euro. Huh? So second is EU. Third is accession membership, which means single market, single market, single market, just trade and investment, and the European political community. From other side, uh, for us, four phases, more money before, but uh, less decision-making rights. Final phase is full-fledged membership after changes of treaties and at the end uh, changes of veto right and uh, cut it to the census minus one or two-third majority for a group of sensitive topics to avoid any kind of intervention of only one country to blockade very important processes within the EU. Let's suppose that we are within the European Union. Uh, where is uh, the way from which side many, um, money of European budget come from? Do you know? From member states. So there are no European original taxes. It is a tax policy of member states. So there are different uh, phases of integration. Now we have this one. So European Union to finance their operation on the level of 1.3% of European GDP uh, collected from the customs, collected from the uh, part of VAT from member states, then collected from the uh, part of uh, base of gross national income. And there is one new revenue. It is also argument that we are not ready. One additional new revenue for European budget is plastic packaging waste that is not recycled. My question towards you, how many kilos of recycled plastic waste we have registered in our Mondstadt? Or we can talk about grams, not about tons. So we have no data about recycling uh, plastic specifically. We have just uh, data about recycling of municipal waste. But what about specifically plastic? What is the uh, base uh, above we need to recycle additionally? In the case that we can't produce that statistics, then we can pay additional money in EU budget. It is Green Deal from, the, from our wallets. EU will introduce new taxes. They promote European taxes, new taxes, European taxes. It is part of emission of trading system. It is a carbon border adjustment mechanism. And it is a taxation of capital transaction. Then it will be 
towards federalization of European budget. It's very important from an economic point of view to understand what does it mean budget. Then we have expenditure and our wish list. Uh, we can talk about strengths. I will not talk a lot about strengths, just shortly. Uh, peace, stability, prosperity, values. It is core group of values what we promote within the integration. European Common Foreign and Security Policy, uh, uh, program of economic reform, uh, improvement of business environment, and of course, uh, judiciary and this set of democratic goals. If we, if we talk about weaknesses, what was the price already paid? It is opening of our market, liberalization, zero tariff rate, and other uh, uh, moving of non-tariff measures, uh, and of course, uh, competitive level of competitiveness of our companies is not so high, and a lot of other potential risks, and specific one, underdeveloped infrastructure and the lack of funds for infrastructure investment. Did you look, did you hear about Berlin process two days before in Tirana? Partly, something. Two things, one is, one is good, one not so good. <laughs> uh, good thing was that they promote strongly uh, joining of our region towards a single uh, European payment area. What does it mean simply? If you like to send 100 euros to some legal entity abroad, it will not be necessary to pay for 100 euros, 30 euros for banking fees. Because uh, costs of banking fees towards abroad, in our case, they are seven times higher than Europe within the European Union. So it is a good thing. What was not so good, one thing, is that they, uh, Albania strongly promote one new railway from Skopje to Drac, then it is parallel from Belgrade to Bar. Hmm? Everybody is trying to find alternatives and to promote their networks. And it is also European integration, strong lobbying. Even this proposal for 2030 is a result of lobbying. Some countries from our region like to postpone integration to solve local issues related to borders. At least they try. In Brussels, they need time for internal reform, which means after election in European uh, Parliament next May. So in that context, they, they create the same interest and then we postponed it all. And who paid the biggest price? Somebody who are negotiating the longer period. Montenegro. Because we adopt the biggest portion of European standard, we fully open our market, but there are still not structural funds for supporting of our business. Opportunities, a lot of opportunities. Of course, uh, I think you are fully aware of this. Maybe you should read it more because of this, just a few hands for supporting Europe integration. And uh, I will put uh, uh, your attention here. A weak communication strategy. A uh, weak uh, 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 lobbying before the European institution. In uh, 10, 15 years after independence, there were something what uh, I call uh, hidden resistance to integration as a fear of dissouveranization. Let's enjoy in independence, not to replace immediately Belgrade with Brussels. But that uh, nice journey. Unfortunately, today we are paying the price. We can, uh, do hope, uh, conclude together that NATO, unfortunately, is not enough. We need also European integration. We need both sides of the coin. So, turning to populism, it is uh, quite, quite uh, spread in all areas of our everyday life. Uh, Endangering of concept of civic state, electoral engineering, and the growth of ethnic distance. Uh, we can see it in different uh, reports of international organization, our public opinions, and of course, uh, we are entering in something what is, uh, uh, what is uh, also named the Bosnianization of Montenegro and ethnic quotas for employment in state institutions. And it's very problematic because we are too small, there are no enough administrative capacities, and even if we add ethnic quota for recruitment, then definitely we will, we will be in huge deficit to have the best 
position covered by the best candidates. Uh, loss of clear boundaries between the executive and legislative, surplus of conditionalities, we change constitution, we change judiciary, uh, appointment of high policies in judiciary, uh, reduction of government discretionary power in conducting economic policy, unclear reading of uh, commission report, risk of unprepared entry, I mentioned one regarding uh, revenues and collection of revenues, and of course, uh, problem with respect to fundamental rights, not only in our country, but all around. Today, we have rule of law reports also within the member states. So there is a lot of risks. There is a lot of threats. I am for European integration. I always promote European Union, but we need to take care about process towards European standard. We need to balance between populist promises and real cost and something what we really can deliver. Always is good approach to promise as much as you can really deliver in specific period of time. It will raise our credibility. If we always promise everything and immediately, of course that it will be against our credibility before the European institution. So what we can conclude in this short uh, analysis, uh, at least I conclude, maybe you can disagree, of course it is also democratic standards sometimes, sometimes painful. <laughs> so, window of opportunity for a speedy integration of Montenegro towards the EU was lost in August 2020 with the fall of uh, actual government in technical mandate, you are fully aware why. Uh, but still, there is no reasonable alternatives in the sense of uh, going to some, towards somewhere else. And uh, we are living in the, in the time of uncertainty with strong external shocks, including war in Ukraine, with the uncertain period uh, in front of us, and the result of all this uh, uncertainty. Uh, integration is cost, so you can't only count on expenditures on uh, uh, EU treated as a cash machine to cover all our needs investment. So EU is a serious set of institutions, uh, supranational organization, uh, sui generis, not state, but uh, much more than international organization, and we need to be fully aware of that. Montenegrin citizens uh, strongly support European integration according to survey, and uh, that message should be much more respected by our political leaders, because they count on their voters and uh, they send a lot of promises towards them regarding this set of expectation. So it is just shortly about what I like to share with you. I am happy that it will be probably published in a separate book in English. I have it already in two books on our language in uh, 2017 and in 2020 in uh, Historiski Zapisi. It is on a website available both in the Europe uh, corner. So uh, I talk about it, I teach about it, and do hope at least one of you will change approach towards supporting integration of our country. Thank you. So first of all, greetings. Uh, my name is Nikolai Lianich. I'm the student of the second year of master's studies here at International Relations at UDG. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for this wonderful panel that's tackling some really deep and important questions and issues. I think it would be, since we're talking about Poland and its fight against disinformation, I think it would be a miss not to mention what occurred in Poland these past few days, the elections, which are quite substantial and actually pose some examples that other countries might uh, uh, follow in suit. Now, namely, it's related to the ruling parties um, cold strangle across the media and its landscape. And uh, that's the party of law and justice, in short, uh, as it was evidenced by OSCE during these, uh, this past election cycle. Now, that's not uncommon, unfortunately, for the European Union. We can see it in Hungary, we can see it in Serbia, where ruling parties have uh, a stranglehold over the media landscape. And in a sense, they 
choke or have like a strong hold over the populace, over the whole discourse. And uh, as we have seen both in Hungary and Serbia last year, the populace was sort of barred thanks to that whole wall of disinformation that was present and they were not able to influence the electorate as much. Now, Poland is a different situation where the citizens did manage to look past that uh, firewall of sorts. What's more, in these authoritarian situations, such as in Hungary and Serbia, related to what we've discussed, uh, there is a strong permeation of Russian influence through such channels. Uh, my question would thus be most likely for our Polish guests, but anyone can answer. Um, what exactly did Poles do differently from people in Hungary or Serbia? What can they learn from the Polish example that was present on and evidenced on Sunday? Thank you. Thanks a lot. And next question. Uh, all questions and later we... Gentlemen, uh, my name is Stefan Radonic. I am a student of the second year of the Humane Studies uh, Faculty of Security. <laughs> yes, so one lady. One lady. Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, the, my, uh, the my question is now, this is my opinion, there were a lot of misinformation also with the Ukrainian war and uh, what's happening to the Middle East and uh, influence here in the Balkans. And now my question uh, will be how effective uh, European Union's policy is if they don't uh, follow their own uh, resolutions, uh, not just the European Union, also the United Nations in that part, since the territory, uh, the territory uh, expansions of like Russia or uh, um, the dissolution of the state, so the referendum like also independence and also the Lugansk, Crimea, and uh, Donetsk uh, regions. Uh, so how, uh, uh, the, uh, my, uh, to summarize, sorry about my English, uh, how do you think Russian aggression and also influence uh, is part of the European Union's policy to, to those independent states? If they don't follow their own uh, resolutions and so, uh, so on. Okay, thanks. And lady, and yeah, we well, so collect one, one more question. Collect one more question. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Jelena Vuletovic, and I'm from Humanistic Studies, and I'm second year student. And my question is dedicated to our situation in Montenegro. And do you think that UAE integration are good presented to our citizens? And do you think that our citizens have a great knowledge about UN integrations and what government to do uh, to help people and inf inform them about UN integration because I know that we have a lot of EU funds that are not uh, not use, used by our citizens and they can help them a lot. It's a question dedicated for your uh, for Professor Jurovic but for al also for other speakers. Okay, so Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot and maybe we start from uh, the communication strategy is something what uh, we can't be so proud because it is quite weak instrument for dissemination of European values and the uh, importance of that part uh, of our country as strategic foreign policy priority. We should uh, invest much more uh, specifically because uh, NGOs are also quite well uh, involved in the process. Uh, they are in working groups and uh, uh, broaden public is interested to know more, specifically local communities and, and uh, local self-governments. So we need to develop much stronger communication strategy, definitely it is not enough. Specifically regarding IPA funds and other um, EU uh, pre-accession uh, support facilities, it uh, should be much, much higher uh, utilized in country. We, we have a risk of decommitment of some funds not only for IPART and for agriculture, but also for environment and in some other area. Good thing as Europe also detected, so they changed a little a rule to, to allow us, if there is a very close to an N plus 2 rule to lose the money, uh, then they allowed us to 
transpone it to other grant if there is enough uh, active programs to spend that money. Uh, so it is good, but on other aspect, if we talk about energy packages, uh, you know, of uh, 30 billions, uh, 16 billion is already spent, committed, and Montenegro is very small portion in that sense. So uh, soon, European Union will probably uh, add new criteria, not only maturity of the projects and uh, relevance of the projects, we have it, but also uh, political damage control, that three countries are not enough competitive to have more uh, investment in clean energy sector, and of course, uh, fair share principle, because there are no national envelopes, but somebody need to take care about that, that each six could be involved in this uh, WBIF uh, network for infrastructure. Do hope that somebody will better negotiate it out position when we talk about investment conferences. It is... Uh, colleague Radonic, yes. If I understood well, uh, you ask uh, your question is going on about the reaction of European Union according to the aggression of Hama. Uh, you can see that is some confusion according to uh, this question now in international community. No consensus in United Nations, no consensus in European Union. You have some states which are opposite. Uh, to make a resolution for stopping the war in uh, Gaza, north part of Gaza, and some uh, states who are supporting Israel to finish for all the time with Hamas. But unfortunately, the victims are civilians, majority the women and uh, the kids. Uh, half and more of the 2,750 victims are the women and the kids. Uh, we will see uh, tomorrow to the Gaza coming George Biden president of the United States. Uh, you know that the biggest supporter for the Israel on the world are United States. And uh, five days ago, or on the beginning of the war, I have the emission press release in the TV VST, when the journalist asked me, when it will be finished this war. I said when United States say stop. What it mean? Uh, a long time, more than 100 years, it's the problem between uh, the Yiddish and the Arabs there. Uh, I'm not optimistic that it will be final solution for that, but I think that it will be start a new way to find the solution for the Palestinians. Today we have the news that more than one million Palestinians uh, left from the north part of Gaza. It is really terrible. It is humanitarian catastrophe, but at the same time, you have three groups, military groups in Palestinian uh, society. It is Hamas, it is Hezbollah, and it is Islamic Jihad. 
Fatah is pacifies. Uh, on the past time, it was the organization on the Palestinians uh, free organization leading by Yasser Arafat. And now the president of Palestinia, uh, Abbas. But what will be the final solution? I think that Israel trying to cleaning this area with Palestinian and to occupate it. Uh, it is ethnic clearing. Uh, the final solution probably will be international conference leading by United States how to do in this moment. But it's using Iran and Russia. And maybe it will be more complicated to find the peace. Uh, for them is useful now, especially for Russia, this war. Because the world opinion moving from Ukraine to the Middle East. We will see. It is not an easy question. Thanks a lot. Yes. Action. So the election saw one huge difference between Poland and Hungary. But in Poland, we have after 25, after 30 years, a strong common uh, community. People goes, uh, went to the election. 75% was uh, uh, turnout, was 75%. It was the biggest turnout in our history. So uh, if you ask me about uh, to compare, so in Poland, we have, uh, we had a government and uh, of course some people support this government somebody was opposed dislike this government but the election was on sunday and on monday everybody we know how to discuss each other in my opinion in hungary we don't have uh, this kind strong uh, common uh, community, especially common people, and you can don't uh, and we don't have uh, a strong opposition in Hungary. In Poland, we have strong government and strong opposition. Of course, Poland is divided. Somebody support former go uh, government and somebody didn't like. But we have two, two options. In Hungary, uh, I think we have only one option. So uh, of course in Poland is a, a huge division, but despite of division, we can still discuss, we can uh, still communicate, uh, so we don't have any uh, problems. Of course, if I compare what's happened 10 years, in, uh, 10 years ago in Poland, this division was smaller, but the division is a uh, normal thing in democracy. So I think it is a huge difference between Poland and Hungary. And what is the most important for you, if I can say, so, you should have a strong government and strong opposition. Because government without strong opposition, it's a not good government. So thanks a lot. Maybe you know you want to, to add something? Uh, I'll take this question. Yes, yes. <laughs> My colleague uh, from yeah. the Center for International This comparison between Poland and Hungary, yes? My name is Bruno Suldo. I'm from Center for International Relations from Poland. It's regard the same question. I should be coming the same question. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, what was the precise uh, uh, question? Uh, could, I know? Could, you could you repeat, please? Yes, yes. Uh,
Yeah. Uh, so uh, the situation is completely different, I would say. I cannot say anything about Serbia. I would say about Poland and Hungary. In my private opinion, uh, as regards media, the situation, what you have pictured is completely different in Poland. It's not like this. Because in Poland, actually, main private media are pro-opposition. And they are extremely strong. Yeah? So both in TV stations and press and uh, internet portals. So actually, uh, it's, um, and they have been strongly supported opposition and, and they were and still they are anti-government. Anti yep. So uh, if you, if you uh, watch television in Poland, probably you either watch uh, those private, strong private anti-government stations or government uh, public television, yes? Um, so I would say, what is, the, what is the difference between Poland and Hungary? In Poland, we have polarization. But both, both poles, yes, both sides are strong, yes? Uh, as regards media, yes, believe me, as regards media, yeah? And as regards or, um, social media and civil um, I would say non-governmental organizations and uh, civic, civil society organizations, they're strong, yeah? And really, they don't spare words to criticize each other. So I would say that the, uh, the proper answer for your question is that the situation in Poland and Hungary is completely different because both sides are strong, opposition and 